take a look at our last famous Ozarker. And I don't know if we saved the best to last, but uh, it's kind of, he's kind of a neat, famous guy. The mustache itself is worth saving him. from. The last guy we had, Bill Doolin, had the big, you know, 19th century mustache, and this guy has got the little pencil-thin mustache. Anybody know who this is? Uh, what do you think he does? You're a pretty good guesser. He, he's not a filmmaker, but he, 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 does have, uh, he does have a prominent role in films. Millie's just, she's got it today. I don't know what it is. This is not Walt Disney, but this is a guy named Buddy Baker. And Buddy Baker was Walt Disney's musical director. Yeah. Yeah. That's some pretty good guessing, Millie. Yeah, Walt. He was uh, from Springfield. He graduated from Southwest, what was then Southwest Baptist College, now Southwest Baptist University in Bolivar and had a very successful career as a music director in Hollywood, mostly with the Walt Disney Company. He uh, scored several of uh, the Disney movies. If you were my age, you would uh, remember some of them because a lot of them were the Disney movies when I was a kid, like the Apple Dumpling Gang. Anybody ever seen that one? With uh, Don Knotts and Tim Conway in it, probably about 40 years old now. Uh, what else? The Shaggy DA, if you might remember that one. Probably about the same era. The Fox and the Hound uh, animated show. And there were some, some other, other ones as well. Uh, he did most of the Winnie the Pooh uh, films uh, from early days and, and TV shows. And uh, he also... Uh, composed a lot of the music for the Disneyland and Disney World theme parks, and some of it is still in use. I believe if you've ever been to the Haunted House at Disney World or Disneyland, I think he did the theme music for, for the Haunted House and some of the Epcot stuff at Disney World. And, uh, but a pretty busy guy uh, from here in Springfield, Buddy Baker. I bet nobody had ever heard of Buddy Baker, had you? Yeah. Well, now you have, so it's, it's good we're, we're learning who Buddy Baker was. Okay, and we don't have a word of the day. We've got our uh, Ozarks pronunciation guide, and this is just a little, as, as I send you off out into the world uh, with what little bit of information you have about the Ozarks. Uh, some of you are natives, and, and you won't need this all that much, although... Uh, as the semester has taught me, you can always use some touching up on your Ozarkness. So this can help you out a little bit. And those of you who aren't natives, uh, just some tips on how to talk like a, like a genuine Ozarker. Uh, the first one is obvious. Uh, never pronounce the G on anything that ends in I-N-G. That's, that's kind of for populist talk in general. If you want to sound like the people, you never pronounce the G. Uh, change the A to Y on the end of most words that end in A. That's, that's, a, that's just a necessity for uh, the rural Ozarks. So that soda pop become, becomes sody pop. And you're from Nixie instead of Nixa. Some of the old timers, there are probably still some old timers around who, who say Nixie. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I planted my okri last week. Hopefully, it'll be up in another week or so. We'll see. We'll see what happens there. Uh, and change the O W to E R at the end of words, so window become or window becomes winder, fellow becomes feller. Yeah. And just anything that ends in an O W, pretty much you can you can turn to. To ER. Uh, now, this is one that uh, a lot of people from the South or from the Ozarks uh, don't really get. I mean, I don't, I don't uh, ever pronounce words that end in EN or IN any differently. They're, they all sound the same to me. 
so that, you know, uh, a, a pen that you stick with is the same as a pen you write with, in the way I say it. Uh, mispronounced vowel sounds. My grandpa was a master at this. You know, every, every vowel sound, basically, he mispronounced it in some way. Uh, he, uh, and you find uh, old-time Ozarkers often avoided short vowel sounds in favor of long vowel sounds. So in a, in a word like uh, calves, it would be pronounced caves. Anybody ever heard that one? If you lived on a farm in the Ozarks, you might, you might occasionally hear that one. But, but I know on, on our farm when I was a kid, uh, my grandpa never had calves. He always had caves. And that was, that was just how he pronounced it. And eggs becomes eggs. Eggs. Yeah. How many, how many eggs makes a dozen? Yeah, instead of eggs. Yeah. How would you say dogs? How do you say dogs? Do you say dogs? Or do you say dogs? No, dogs is one that you can. Dogs. Yeah, it's it's a dog. But but the way the way uh, people in the South and and most of the Ozarks say dog is is different. We don't we don't say dog, it's dog, dog. you know D A U G, yeah. dog. Yeah. Like fur. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. And fur can also be far. far. Yeah. How far was that? Fire. Not yet. Well, we're getting to that one. That's, that, that's, that's on the next page. There's two pages. You know, it's, you don't just go out there and start pronouncing stuff all willy-nilly. you got to know what you're talking about. So there are two pages of rules here. Uh, if I'm going to turn you loose, I get... Uh, here's, and here's what you're talking about. Uh, Avoid long eyes so that fire becomes far in the Ozarks. Fire is far. A tire is a tar. You know what I'm talking about. You know, you, you, get, a, you get a flat tar. No, we don't talk that Yeah, you, you do. You're, you're from Ava. You talk like that. <laughs> Quit. These people will still like you. Don't, don't deny your heritage. Yeah. And uh, I know south of Ava, you know, around Squars. Yeah. Uh, well, we've already established that Gainesville apparently has really gotten uptown since the last time I was there. But uh, uh, so, so wire becomes war. war. Uh, I remember one time uh, I was on a, on a college bowl team or a quiz bowl team, whatever you call it in college, and my, my roommate was on the team with me. Uh, one of the smartest guys you would ever meet uh, but he was, like me, he was a farm kid from North Arkansas. And the answer to one of the questions in this, in this uh, quiz bow was Richard Pryor. You guys, some of you remember Richard Pryor, the, uh, uh, the comedian, you know, what, maybe the greatest comedian of all time. And my, my friend, you know, buzzes in and says, Richard Pryor. That was his answer, Richard Pryor. And the guy, the guy who's reading the questions was from Boston, not the Boston Mountains, but Boston, Massachusetts. And he kind of looks at him like, the Richard's right, but I don't know what in the world you said after, after that. And somebody kind of intercepted, I think it was me. I think I, I said, you know, he's, he means prior. Let me, you know, translate for my friend here. <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, but, yeah, Richard, Richard Pryor. Uh, so what do you think Marn would be short for? It's a name. It's a proper name. Myron. Myron. Yeah. If you're, if your name, if you, if you're, Parents, unfortunately, named you Myron. In the Ozarks, you would be Marn. Or if they named you Byron, you'd be Barn. It's a lot easier that way. Who needs two syllables? You know, just, just shorten it down. So, uh, so what's, what's an arn? An iron? Yeah, you arn your clothes with an arn. So you're getting the hang of it. Yeah, that's... Uh, and... Yeah, you, you shorten words down when you can, so you omit those syllables. I remember one of my favorite words that my grandpa always said was fard instead of forehead. You know, I, I hit that cow on the fard, that kind of thing. Millie's just 
she just doesn't understand this at all, do you? <laughs> and uh, Will Bar or Will Bear, you know, it depends on what part of the region you're in for Will Barrow. And, uh, and this is one of my favorites. And this doesn't happen much anymore because most people since World War II have a lot of times changed the pronunciation of their name to match the spelling. But if you were able to transport yourself back 100 years and just wander around the rural Ozarks, you would find that many people seemingly mispronounced their names. They didn't always pronounce their names the way that their names were spelled. And these are just some examples that, that I can think of from back home, the way that some old timers pronounced their, their names when I was a kid. In some cases, they still do. But like the name Reynolds was pronounced Runnels. And if you didn't know what they were saying, you wouldn't have a clue how to, how to spell the name. But that's uh, Cochran was pronounced Callhorn. How you get Callhorn out of Cochran, I don't know. But that's, that's just how the old timers pronounced it. Uh, this one is still pronounced that way. I know some people named Daddle. Uh, they, they pronounce their name Daddle, but it's spelled Dowdle. Uh, and then uh, we've talked about this before. The... Even the prominent uh, Campbell family here in Springfield, the one that Campbell is named after, uh, up until a couple of generations ago, would have pronounced their name Campbell. Or, a lot, or you know, their, their ancestors would have pronounced their name Camel without the, the B in it. I think we've mentioned the uh, Camel 66 trucking company that had the Camel uh, mascot on it because that's how the name was pronounced. Uh, but here's some other example: Buckhannon instead of Buchanan, uh, Mathis instead of Matthews. Uh, that was, I know a family who up until a generation or so ago pronounced their name Mathis, but it's spelled like we would say Matthews and some of these others down here. And just a couple years ago, the, the University of Arkansas had a, had a linebacker on the football team who spelled his name this way and pronounced it that way. So he was, his family was following that old thing where you turn the A's into I's or, or, or E's or Y's on the end of it. So Huckabah becomes Huckabee. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of people got confused over that one. And the last rule, of course, is never, never say the word pronunciation. That would give you away as a non-Ozarker, right? You know. Just say how we say words. Yeah, no, don't say pronunciation. All right, so that's your, that's your Ozark rules. All right, we know that extractive industry has, has long been important in the Ozarks. We talked uh, about a little bit about the importance of the, the timber industry and the mining industry in the Ozarks. And for the most part today, where the timber industry is still important in the Ozarks, and where mining is still important in the Ozarks is the same places where it has always uh, been important, or at least been important in the region for 100 years or more. And the, the timber and lumber business is not as large as it was 100 years ago during the boom period, uh, because that 100 years ago period was, was living off of virgin timber, and it's been long gone. And what you have now are smaller businesses. In some cases, you have corporate timber industries involved in the Ozarks, but a lot of cases you have just small mom and pop uh, sawmills and shops of different kinds, handle factories and, and pallet factories and, and things like that spread around the region. Uh, even in some places, uh, charcoal is still a, a big thing. Around Salem, Missouri, uh, there's still... Uh, an important charcoal industry in northeast Oklahoma. And, uh, and you can see the uh, leftovers of, of the charcoal industry in a lot of places in the Missouri Ozarks. Missouri used to be a major charcoal producer. It still produces lots of charcoal, but uh, not quite on the scale that it used to. Uh, Branson used to have a big charcoal factory. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's, it's, still, it's still a big business in some places. And, the, and, and you may have seen the, uh, the charcoal, I, I can't remember what they call them, the little huts 
that they actually make the charcoal in. They're, they're sort of distinctive looking, little kind of rounded things, usually metal, kind of long metal buildings that are kind of rounded on top. And, and uh, you still see a lot of them. A lot of them are not in use anymore. Yeah, I think it's just, you can kind of see it. Just It's north of town, I believe, in a kind of a little holler there. Yeah. Uh, what's the, uh, one of the big charcoal companies partially got started in, in Branson. Um, I don't think it's Kingsford. What's another big charcoal company? Royal Oak. That one, Royal Oak. Uh, there was a Royal Oak factory down there, and the, uh, the man who, who started that, uh, whose name was Keeter, if you've ever been, does anybody go to the School of the Ozarks? Ever been to or the College of the Ozarks? There's a Keeter Center down there, named after that family. Uh, he was in the charcoal business. That's how he got his, that's how he made his money, was in the charcoal business. Yeah, so, so that, uh, charcoal was a, uh, Pretty big business. Again, it's declined a little bit uh, in the last generation or so, uh, but still pretty big. And uh, and then of course you've got your your mining. the The new lead belt opened after the old lead belt played out, and the new lead belt is over in the uh, over sort of on the other side of Salem, Missouri, uh, back out uh, in that in that direct the Viburnum and. Uh, some of those towns over in there. Uh, it's kind of, it's isolated and you don't really drive by it going to anywhere uh, to get to those, uh, those mining operations in the new lead belt. And then down in Arkansas, one of the uh, big mineral booms of the last 10 years or so has been uh, uh, drilling for natural gas. And that seems to have eased up a little bit in the Arkansas Ozarks, but it's still... Uh, still underway down there, and that's uh, caused a lot of change in the very southern part of the Ozarks. Is that called like fracking? Or yeah, like fracking. Oh yeah, there are all kinds of heat on that. Yeah, that yeah, it's, is. yeah, and it's not just uh, here, I mean, it's going on in Pennsylvania and West Virginia and around the country, and you hear a lot of uh, news reports and read a lot of news about environmental issues, and one of the issues they were having in Arkansas a few years ago was uh, they discovered that the, uh, the, the fracking or part of the fracking process was, was triggering earthquakes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, I mean, you know, you're talking about some pretty serious stuff when uh, I felt a couple of them. And, and, and my house in Arkansas is not anywhere near where they drill for, these, uh, for this natural gas. I mean, that's, you know, there's some pretty... Probably is, yeah. Anywhere they've got these shale fields that have natural gas in them, they're, they're fracking and they, they I, I don't know the, the science behind it, but they kind of dig down and then they, then they dig sideways. And it's this poor. Yeah, 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 it is. And then uh, the, what, I mean, they've known for years that, that that natural gas was down there, but it's only been within the last 10 or 15 years that they've got the technology and it's efficient, you know, financially efficient enough to actually go down there and get it. Because you can look back at, uh, uh, I remember doing research once, and there were all these oil companies, this little remote place in the Arkansas Ozarks that's being overrun now by these natural gas companies. All these oil companies were down there staking claims and buying up mineral rights and stuff like that because they could read a geological map too, and they knew the shale was under there. They just didn't have an economical way to get it out of the ground back then. But it's really, it's really boomed in the last 10 years in Arkansas and in lots of other places around the United States. Yeah, I guess uh, that's part of what's going on maybe in the Dakotas. You know, they've had a lot of uh, expansion up there, oil drilling and stuff. Here's a, another homemade map here and you can see what, what this map indicates is counties that are m the most dependent on the f what, what's called the forest products industry, on, on timber and lumber production, saw milling, uh, that kind of stuff. And not surprisingly, 
uh, the, the ones who are most dependent are the ones down here in the old pine belt of southeast Missouri where the virgin pine forest was being cut 100, 130 years ago. Uh, counties like uh, Shannon and Reynolds and Carter County and then the surrounding counties are pretty heavily dependent. And even as far west, well this is Dade County and I'm not exactly sure what the story there is, but even over here to Douglas and, and Ozark County, uh, you have some dependence on uh, forest products, but in those places it's going to be mainly hardwood and not pine. And in, in most of the places in the Ozarks today it's, it's hardwood, but there is still some pine forest uh, cutting that goes on in southeast Missouri. So nowhere near the, the boom times of 100 years ago, but still an important industry in, in a lot of places. Now one of the, the major changes that's happened uh, since the World War II era and going back a little bit before that in some cases is the increasing uh, land ownership and involvement of the federal government in the Ozarks from uh, the establishment of national forests to uh, national parks to military installations and we've already talked about the building of all the dams that the Army Corps of Engineers built around the region that's helped change the face of the Ozarks in many ways by creating all these man-made lakes. And of course today we've got uh, thousands of acres in both Arkansas and Missouri that are under the control of the, of the National Forest Service. In Arkansas, it's the Ozark National Forest. In Missouri, uh, they're all in the Mark Twain National Forest. And uh, we'll look at a map just in a minute that shows you where the, these are. It's not one contiguous forest in either places. It's little patchy forests. And uh, the Arkansas National Forest, or the Ozark National Forest, uh, started being formed uh, in the early 1900s. The Mark Twain National Forest started, I believe, in the 1930s and, and was kind of uh, slowly built up as the government bought more and more farmland from farmers and then let it revert back to forest land and then managed it uh, as forest land. Conservation, not preservation, that's what the National Forest Service does. What's the difference between conservation and preservation? Right, in, in the national uh, forests, uh, they're not preserved, they're not meant to be pristine and keep away from us. They, they manage the timber resources, as Millie says, and allow selective cutting on them. They don't, they don't uh, allow clear cutting or anything like that, but the National Forest Service manages uh, the cutting of the forests uh, for uh, price. Uh, people who come in and cut you know, pay a rate to the National Forest Service. And as opposed to a situation like a national park or something where you have preservation uh, where the forests are not cut and you sort of leave them as they are. And nowadays the National Forest Service even does things like <coughs> controlled burns. For years and years and years the Forest Service insisted that the, the old Ozark tradition which goes even farther back to an old Indian tradition of burning the woods and burning the prairies and stuff was a no-no, that it was destructive to the environment. And as with so many things, you give it enough, enough years and all of a sudden we switch our view and nowadays the National Forest Service even does uh, many of its own uh, controlled burns because there are some benefits, ecological benefits to burns that we didn't appreciate 50 or 60 years ago that, that they know now as these forests have developed over the years. Uh, of course, you've got the Ozark National Scenic Riverways that we talked about in southeast Missouri, Current River and Jacks Fork River, uh, land that's owned and maintained by uh, the national government, National Park Service, not the Forest Service. And uh, the Buffalo National River, this is a picture of the, the buffalo with the hog farm looming somewhere 
five miles away. I, I'm not sure exactly where it's going to be. Uh, and then, of course, one of the largest government projects in the Ozarks of the 20th century was the creation of Fort Leonard Wood and uh, outside of Waynesville, uh, mostly in Pulaski County, Missouri. A massive undertaking during World War II, creating this military installation used for training troops, and it's still a very active Army uh, fort today. And just as with a lot of these other things, uh, with Fort Leonard Wood, a lot of farmers were forced to sell their land and were moved off to other places. And, you know, you got a big off-limits military installation up there now in the middle of the Ozarks. And, of course, we talked about the, the dams built by the Army Corps of Engineers. So there has been, uh, even though we, uh, a lot of people think of the Ozarks as a place where you can kind of get away from the government and get off in the backwoods and live your life unfettered and all that kind of stuff. Just like anywhere in America, there's plenty of government influence, state and federal, in this case, government influence. And here's a map showing where the forest, you can see the Mark Twain forest, the puzzle pieces just scattered all around southern Missouri. And there's even another piece that we can't see that they cut out for some reason that's up farther up uh, close to the Missouri River. And this is the Ozark National Forest here, uh, one little segment of it, and then the big chunks. This is all Boston Mountains territory. And if you... How reliable is that map? Uh, I'm not sure, it's, it's pretty close. Uh, yeah, I, did, I didn't make that map, I, I will, I will uh, you know, make that statement right off the bat. Some of the, I just make the homemade maps with the black and the gray on them. That's my specialty, you know. Right, when they started, when, see they didn't start until the 20th century, start building these national forests. And when they, you know, the first idea was to take land that hasn't yet been claimed by anybody, land that's still in the public domain. And, and some of this land, like down in the, in the Washita National Forest, some of this land, and some of this land was still in the public domain. It was, it was so mountainous, so hilly, that it had just never been claimed by anybody, never even been homesteaded. So no one had even claimed it as free land. And then when they started doing that, uh, they, they, they turned that public domain land into national forest. Then is when they started gradually buying up parcels of privately owned land around that and sometimes pressuring people to sell, and sometimes people just, you know, the land's not any good anyway, we might as well sell this. And, and gradually the national forests get bigger and bigger, and the same thing happens uh, in, in Missouri as well. Uh, you start with land that was never claimed and then gradually, you know, build it up by paying for land that's in the vicinity, Yeah. And that's uh, national forest land almost naturally is, uh, tends to be rugged, hilly, sort of not, not very good for traditional agriculture. And that's, that's kind of the thing. You know, you can have, uh, at one time there were massive forests, say, in the Delta on what now is very, very fertile farmland down there because it's been, they, they cut the trees down, drain the swamps, all that stuff. But for the most part, uh, these forested areas, even when you cut down the trees in the Ozarks, they're still uh, rocky, rugged hillsides and things like that, and, and they're not great for agriculture. And that's part of the reason the national government tried to take as much of this land in as possible uh, to get it out of agricultural production to prevent things like erosion, hillsides washing away and, and stuff like that. Yeah, if you could, and the thing about it, much of this land was at one time privately owned and farmed. You know, it would probably surprise most of us to drive through national forest land today if we knew, if, we could, if there was some magic way they could show us on a map what the land used to look like 
uh, what land was farmed. And it would probably surprise you of some of the rugged country that was farmed at one point. And if you, if you really looked, you could probably see some of the scars of that. Uh, big ditches that had eroded that have now been kind of camouflaged by second growth timber and, and underbrush and all that kind of stuff. All right, and here's a, uh, again, here's, here's the northern part of, of the Mark Twain. And so some of that goes north of the interstate. Yeah, Cedar Creek. Yeah, we live like on Cedar Creek. Okay, so that, that part. Right there, yeah. yeah. And you can see the rest of the, these little jigsaw puzzle pieces scattered around the region. And then this one's a little harder to tell what's going on. This is actually the state line, Missouri Arkansas state line. And this is the Ozark National Forest, a little bit closer view. And part of the Ozark National Forest is on the south side of the Arkansas River down here. We'll look at just a little bit at the political situation in the Ozarks, which is really interesting, uh, especially here in the 21st century, as the Ozarks seems to be getting more and more Republican. I don't know that we're getting more and more conservative. Uh, you might say we've always been conservative, but our Republicanism is starting to catch up with our conservatism in many ways. And... Uh, now, I left Arkansas off this map, or I didn't fill in any of the Arkansas counties, and I'll explain what the, the colors are in a minute, uh, because Arkansas doesn't make it nearly as easy to find out what political affiliation local county elected officials are. Uh, for Missouri, that's e very easy to find that information out, and I looked and I looked and I looked uh, at, all over the Internet, and I just couldn't find a good place to gather that information for, for Arkansas. But what these colors are, and I did this back the first time that I taught this class two years ago, back in the spring of 2011, the 2010 midterm election had just happened. And what I did was I went in and I looked at the county officials, uh, county clerk and treasurer and commissioners and all that kind of stuff for, for all of the Missouri Ozarks counties and looked at the political affiliation, what political party they were from, the ones who had got elected. And the red counties are the ones that were solidly Republican. And as you would expect, Southwest Missouri, uh, solidly Republican for generations here in Southwest Missouri. Uh, the blue ones were solidly Democratic or Dem Democratic Party. And the green ones were the ones who were pretty evenly split between Democrats and Republicans in local offices. Now, I didn't go by presidential elections or, or anything like that. If I had a presidential election map, practically the entire Ozarks would be red. Because for years and years, the Ozarks has been voting for Republican presidential candidates. Even at the same time that many places in the Ozarks still elect local Democratic Party candidates to local uh, county offices. And, and so it's a pretty good, a pretty good indication of this, the political situation in the Ozarks for the last few generations where you had solidly red southwest Missouri, mostly blue southeast Missouri, and then this kind of middle ground in between where there was a two-party system on the local level for up until recently and for the most part most of North Arkansas would still be blue on the county level uh, for instance the, the county uh, that I grew up in still has uh, all uh, Democrats in, in local county elected offices though the county votes overwhelmingly Republican in presidential elections and probably even in state elections for like U.S. Senator and, and stuff like that. Uh, so often voting patterns don't always make sense in that way. Voting for local candidates in the minds of many people in the Ozarks is a very different thing than voting for national candidates, especially in these blue county areas. Because most of these places would have voted 
uh, firmly against Barack Obama last fall at the same time that they're electing Democratic Party members to, to local offices. And my friend who lives in Jefferson City uh, refers to this as the Highway 63 divide, the political divide in the Ozarks. I think I've got the right highway. 63 is the one that goes through Houston and up to Rolla, right? And yeah, it comes down, 63 comes down through here. And, and he always, before, even before I actually sat down and made the map, he used to talk about the Highway 63 divide. To the west, you have Republican territory. To the east, you have Democratic territory in Missouri. And it's pretty, you know, it's pretty accurate. In recent years, what you've seen, and, and uh, I need to, to go back and look after last fall's election. I need to update this map. Uh, and see if any of these blue counties have become greener or maybe even red because there's been really a resurgence of republicanism even in traditionally democratic areas of the Ozarks. And uh, one of the things that happened just this past fall is for the first time since Reconstruction, right after the Civil War, uh, the state of Arkansas went red, uh, meaning that a majority of the members to the state House of Representatives and the state Senate in, in the state of Arkansas are now Republicans. First time in way over 100 years that that's happened. And uh, so the, uh, you know, Missouri is still very red, Arkansas becoming redder. And, of course, some of our most prominent Politicians on the national scene in recent years have been Republicans, or the prominent po politicians from the Ozarks, uh, like John Ashcroft. He was the Attorney General under, uh, I think, in the first administration of George W. Bush and uh, has connections here in Springfield. Ashcroft, uh, rep uh, conservative Republican. His uh, father, I believe, was the president of Evangel College. Is that right? And yeah, there, I know he's a, a assembly, of, assembly of God connection, strong connection to the Assembly of God Church. But John Ashcroft, very prominent. Uh, uh, Tim Hutchinson, most of you don't remember Tim Hutchinson, but he was the first Republican U.S. Senator elected from Arkansas after Reconstruction. He was elected back, uh, back in the 90s and uh, was defeated after one term in office. But not necessarily because of his party. I think he was in, had some personal issues, uh, you know, women issues. That politicians tend to stumble into that kind of stuff, right? Uh, and Roy Blunt, of course, he's back in uh, office now. He's uh, in in the Senate, uh, and and Roy Blunt is from here in Southwest Missouri, and uh, I think has a master's degree from. Missouri State. There are basically, not counting Oklahoma, and I hate to keep leaving Oklahoma out of this, but uh, I haven't been counting them half the semester, so why start now, right? The, uh, not counting uh, Northeast Oklahoma, which I'm not sure what congressional district that falls into, but there are basically five representatives in, in Congress who represent part, all or parts of the Ozarks. Uh, three in Missouri and two in Arkansas. And in Missouri, you've got uh, District 4 comes down from almost Kansas City and then gets uh, tour. It comes out all the way down to Webster County. District 4 does. Most of Webster County is in District 4 uh, right. and a couple other Ozark counties. And then you've got District 7, which is where we are here in southwest Missouri. And District 8 is, covers uh, all of southeast Missouri and, and south central Missouri. Uh, both the Boot Heel and the Ozarks part. And then uh, in Arkansas, you got District 3, which is Northwest Arkansas and Western Arkansas, and District 1 covers uh, the rest of the Arkansas Ozarks and then a lot of the Delta. And all five of those representatives today are Republicans. So all, so all of the uh, congressmen and women representing the Ozarks today in the House of Representatives are Republicans. You've got uh, Vicki Hartzler from District 4, uh, Billy Long, 
uh, from here in District 7. Joanne Emerson just resigned uh, earlier this year from District 8. She had been in office there for years and, and years, and she resigned to take, a, to take a national job, and they're actually having the special election to replace her next month, about a month from now. Uh, a Republican will probably win that election, but I don't know that for sure. And then in Arkansas, you got Steve Womack in the Northwest and Rick Crawford in the Northeast, and both of those are newly elected Republican officers. As a matter of fact, Rick Crawford, who uh, is the representative for my home county down in Arkansas, is the first Republican elected to that office since Reconstruction uh, to, that, to that district's uh, office. So quite a, you know, quite a story of the Republicanization of the Ozarks in recent years where the influence of Southwest Missouri, which traditionally has been the strongest uh, o uh, Republican part of the Ozarks, seems to have kind of spread out to the, to the rest of the Ozarks. But one of these days I'll get the, the entire map color-coded when Arkansas cooperates and lets people get to their statistics without calling each county courthouse to find out what your officers are. All right. So from politics to drug busts, uh, and there is a connection because Carter County's former sheriff, Tommy Adams, uh, who I'm guessing was a Democrat, I don't know, he was, uh, that was one of our blue counties, I believe, uh, was just sentenced to 10 years in prison last summer, as was one of the deputies from Carter County. Uh, his sentence uh, was related to methamphetamine charges. And I think there may have been some weapons charges in there as well. But the first time uh, that I taught this class two years ago, he had just, he got arrested, I think, that semester in the spring of 2011 when he was arrested on a, on a drug bust. And, you know, that's quite a, that was a national story when a sheriff of a county got arrested on, for meth charges, and especially when the county just happened to be in Missouri, the meth capital of the world. Uh, that was something that was going to make headlines. Uh, but for most of the last 12 or 15 years, Missouri has led the nation in uh, meth lab busts. Uh, we continue, I think there was one year when California beat us, uh, but they got a lot more people than we do. We still had them per capita, I'm sure. And, uh, and so it's, you know, it's been a major issue now this map is, uh, uh, shows you, this is just raw numbers, this is not per capita statistics and just raw numbers, the number of meth uh, busts, and you can see that suburban St. Louis uh, tends to, to lead the way, but there's, you know, there's a lot more people up there, and a lot more people to bust than there are, but you can see some, uh, down in here there's some dark counties uh, where... There have been quite a few busts as well, and here's the, the little thing. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those, I, and I don't know how to explain uh, Missouri's story, you know, why, why Missouri. Uh, I guess you could, you could sugarcoat it and say our law enforcement is much better at making busts. I don't, I don't know. We've, we've talked about the... Uh, uh, Branson, I don't know if it's Taney County or Branson, has, has recently passed a, 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 a rule or ordinance requiring you to have a prescription to get uh, pseudoephedrine or ephedrine. Uh, and so you can't get it over the counter anymore. And, and that's what, apparently that's what they're looking at here as well as possibly uh, doing that. And then the other question uh, had to do, uh, Millie, seems to be really interested in, in, in the manufacture of methamphetamine here. Uh, but you've got, there are different methods of, of, of making it. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, your, your nearest internet portal will tell you all you need to know about how to make I, I'm, I'm guessing there's probably all kinds of instructions. Yeah. 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 You need to do it from the library or something, right? <laughs> from a public... Uh, 
Yeah, you know, they were saying that uh, I was uh, listening to the radio a couple of days ago, and they were talking about that maybe these uh, these Boston bombers, the the Boston Marathon bombers, had had learned how to make bombs off the internet or something, and you know, you can just what you know anything's out there pretty much, yeah. and and uh, yeah. yeah, so but but uh, you've got to start there. Uh, it's and I and I know that that's the it's a dangerous thing. I, I know uh, of uh, at least I know at least one person who had a meth lab blow up on him, and uh, you know as if that weren't bad enough, then he got to recuperate in jail and then spend a couple years in prison. You know after after the recuperation. So uh, you know it's a it's a it is a very dangerous sort of thing. Yeah. What uh, Winter's Bone. Uh, the movie that's uh, what are they? He snorts it, he snorts it. in there, I, uh, and I don't I don't remember if anybody shoots it up or or smokes it or anything like that. But uh, it's uh, and of course one of the things that has so closely identified Missouri with the meth industry the last couple of years was the success of the 2010 film Winter's Bone, uh, which was based on the earlier. A novel by Daniel Woodrell uh, is very true to the novel, and the novel is very much focused on this kind of meth subculture in South Central Missouri. Uh, the film was actually made here in Southwest Missouri, uh, but you know, a very powerful novel and a and a powerful film that uh, that unfortunately probably a lot of people watched and and interpreted as a documentary of life in the Ozarks, you know, and, and, I, and you know, I say that partially in jest, but I think a lot of people did see that, a lot of LA, New York coastal people saw, saw that and thought, well, that's how life is in the Ozarks. And, uh, and it is for, there's a certain subset of the Ozarks uh, for whom life is like that, but uh, uh, many of you commented in your journals, those of you who wrote about Winter's Bone and, and things like that, uh, usually made the comment that most people in the Ozarks, as we know, uh, don't live like that and, and aren't involved in that, in that subculture. Uh, but, uh, but the thing about the novel is, uh, the, the novel is a, is a work of art, and it doesn't have to be a documentary. He, Daniel Woodrell doesn't have to try to represent the full spectrum of the Ozarks. Uh, it would be much less interesting if he did uh, have a chapter or two on the accountants and school teachers of West Plains. You know, that was, uh, who wants to read about that? Unless they're doing meth, they're not very interesting. <laughs> and uh, so they, uh, you know, that's, that's just part, that's part of it. And so I, I really, I really like the novel and I really like the, the movie. Uh, but I, I do know that some people who aren't familiar with the Ozarks saw that as a statement of true life in the Ozarks, and that, and that bothers people from the Ozarks. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the, the reality TV uh, just kind of splash of, of hillbilly life that we seem to be enjoying right now uh, yeah, uh, that's, uh, fortunately, I don't think they've come out with, well, I, I wouldn't say they haven't come out with, the, the, you know, the, the meth chronicles or something. Uh, they, they seem to have everything else. They do have the moonshiners, uh, but, uh, cop, well, yeah, cops, that's basically the meth show, isn't it, from the other side. Uh, that's, that's quite a, quite a show, but, uh, but that's one of the, one of the big issues, uh, law enforcement issues, other 21st century issues, uh, certainly environmental issues will continue to be important in the Ozarks, whether it's environmental issues having to do with agriculture, like the proposed hog farm near the Buffalo River, uh, or old, air, old mining areas that are no longer mined but are sort of pits of muck and refuse that, you know, that are ugly and, and potentially hazardous uh, to people's health. You've got uh, lots of 
lots of often hidden environmental issues in the Ozarks, unless you actually go to these places. You know, if you just drive through, everything's scenic and often pristine looking, but maybe not so much behind, uh, behind the scenes. And, uh, and even with like the Bu Buffalo National River and the current river and these different rivers, th there are environmental issues there as, as more and more people float the rivers and leave trash. And uh, that's something that has always uh, been a problem for people who promote tourist use of these places, but at the same time uh, sort of regret the heavy usage of these places because of the of the noise pollution and the, and the regular pollution that comes about. Now, one of the uh, main issues here in the Ozarks, just like everybody else, what is our economic future? Where will future generations get their jobs? What will the jobs be? What will the industry be here? Will we all be working service jobs, you know, working in the tourist industry at some point uh, as as we outsource uh, our manufacturing jobs increasingly, uh, as mines shut down and uh, you know, potentially environmental standards uh, continue to chip away at that. Uh, that is a, that's a big issue. Uh, and you know, I don't really know what the, the future of the Ozarks is uh, from that standpoint, if, uh, if it will be a place that continues to grow with these Fortune 500 companies or uh, you know, or if it will come to, to resemble more the vast majority of Ozarks counties that don't have these Fortune 500 companies and, and where poverty is uh, very high, uh, higher than national standards and uh, where jobs are scarce and where increasingly large numbers of people live off of public support of one kind or another. You know, that's... That seems to be a, uh, an increasing issue in the Ozarks, especially in the rural and small town Ozarks, is the, the increasing dependency on, on federal programs, uh, disability programs and, and other federal programs. Uh, this is a, if I can get this to work, we'll take a look at this map. And what you will notice, this is a 2009 map uh, from the New York Times. It is a, as you can see here, they call it a, a government benefits, or you might call it government dependency map that, that measures people's dependency on things like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, disability. And you come down, you can see the darker the counties are, and this is a nationwide map of counties, the darker the counties are, the heavier the dependence is on these federal programs. And you can see here in the Ozarks, it's pretty dark in there. Uh, you've definitely got one of the national clusters of heavy dependency is in the Ozarks, and especially in South Central, uh, Southeastern, and North Central Arkansas. The, and that's not coincidentally the... Uh, part of the Ozarks that tended to be blank on all of our maps. You know, there's not a whole lot going on in, in some of these counties. And you've got, uh, one of the things you can do, if you pull this up on Blackboard, you can scroll over the counties and it will tell you, uh, here's Ripley County, Missouri, one of the poorest counties in Missouri, uh, 44, over 44 and a half percent of all county income is uh, from these various sources. From, yeah, from, and, and then you can, uh, there's some way to go in here. Oh, there, like you can, uh, you can go over here and change the map a little bit to reflect unemployment, veterans, Medicaid, that kind of stuff. And let's see. Yeah, quite low, less than 20%. So you can see, I mean, we know just from being in the Ozarks that there is a huge discrepancy between a prosperous area like Greene County and a not prosperous area like so much of southeast Missouri, the, the poorest part 
of the, of the Ozarks. And, and these are statistics that kind of reflect uh, that dependence on, on government programs over there. Here's a couple poor ones up here too, Benton County, uh, Hickory County. Uh, it says all transfer income per capita. Yeah, that's the uh, and they're uh, what they call transfer income is basically government program income, and that's how much of it is shelled out per capita. And that's a lot of over eleven thousand bucks. That's a lot of yeah, yeah. And of course now now keep in mind we've already talked about the prevalence of retirees in the Ozarks. And that can certainly skew the numbers because there are lots and lots of retired people who depend on Social Security or, or get Social Security even if they don't depend on it in the Ozarks. And that's going to show up on there as well. Uh, but then, you, of course, you've got some uh, very, very prosperous uh, where Walmart is headquartered, Benton County, Arkansas, you can see there, less than 15%. So very little dependence on, on the government there. Neighboring Washington County, just 15.5%. But there's Ozark County, over 40%. Wright County. But uh, it's just, a, if you like maps and you like stats, then you can go to town on this thing for days. I think I'm down to the next report. It's really, really dark. Okay. Uh, yeah, more than likely. I, I don't know where reservations are in New Mexico from one place to another. But, I, but what, what you find generally on this map, the, sort of the three problem areas, if you want to call them that, you've got, uh, you've got some counties in the south that have very large African-American populations like Delta counties. There are several of those that are extremely poor. You've got uh, counties that have large percentages of Native Americans that are very poor, and then you've got your poor white counties in the Ozarks and Appalachia. And those are the, uh, especially in, in rural America, those are the, the problem areas on a map like this. Yeah, see, you've got, uh, here's Sierra County. And I don't know uh, really enough about that. But yeah, in Kentucky, you've got Leslie County is one of the really poor ones. You're talking about coal mining country over in here. And then down here in the, like the Mississippi Delta. Heavy population of retirees, older folks in, in the Ozarks that are dependent on Social Security, especially in north central Arkansas. That's my home county there. Very high percentage of Social Security. So, so that link is up there if you want to check that out. But, uh, and oh, that's about all the time we have. Uh, and we've covered most of these, these issues. We've got about five minutes left. And uh, I'll be happy to entertain questions about what we've talked about. Uh, today about uh, 21st century issues in the Ozarks. Not too much about the future of the Ozarks because I don't really know. I'm a historian. I don't deal with the future all that much. The past is much more interesting.